Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us this week for the first time or watching the recording, and welcome back uh, people who are here for our original uh, session. I'm Christine Valenza Shin. I'm class of 84, and I'm the Associate Dean for Beyond Barnard, which is the college's hub for career advising and on-campus jobs and graduate school and fellowship advising and, and a couple of other, other key initiatives. So welcome and uh, I'm going to jump right into our session today on resumes and um, feel free to participate via the chat. I'm going to throw out a couple of questions and you can ask questions as well. I'm going to do a couple of other interactive things and then at the end uh, we'll have uh, leave time for questions and answers. You can unmike if you unmute if you would like and ask your question live or you can type it to me directly or into the chat to everyone. So let me do a little screen sharing here. Right. And oh. I seem to have lost my little button that lets me. Sorry. Okay, well, I'm going to assume you all can see this okay. It's not going to make for the prettiest presentation, but the key is to get started and get through the, the, um, through the slides and the information. So our title, our title today is Resumes That Work and uh, subtitle Highlighting Your Skills and Accomplishments. And that's our, our main goal today is to look at uh, what for some of you will be a slightly different orientation on uh, how to approach your resumes. So as I noted last week, this is part, this presentation is part of the Beyond Barnard Summer Colloquium, which is our fancy name for our summer programming uh, that we launched last summer in the midst of the pandemic to try and jump into the uh, void of uh, canceled or postponed internships and people on furlough and, and other uh, economic uh, workplace disarray. Um, but we're continuing it this summer, even though things are uh, looking up and we want to continue uh, the dialogue. As we did last week as well, we'll start with a nature image reminding us that it is summer outside, at least here in the Northeast. And um, take a breath, reminder to me as well as you, take a little breath, take a moment to relax and get ready to go over our topics. So what we're looking at today, some resume basics, I'm going to assume since you're all graduates that we don't need to go over the resume point by point by point. Um, hopefully you've done enough of them that you've got a general sense of how they're formatted and how they work. Um, but we want to uh, clue in on some, some basic good points. Um, and then we'll look at uh, one of our main topics today, which is how to highlight your achievements rather than just describe your job and your work. And then we'll do a little bit of practice look at some ways you can make your bullets more effective. And, um, and then we'll summarize sort of big picture again, some of the do's and don'ts and, and frequently asked questions that come up um, from people. So great. So I'm going to ask you a, a, a quick quiz question, two quick quiz questions. Um, you're feel free to um, just think of your answer. You could throw it in the chat, although I don't have the chat visible at this point. So, but um, the first question is, what is the purpose of a resume? So think about that for a moment. Think about what first comes to mind. And there's there's a couple of different purposes, but for, for what we want to talk about today, um, we want to have a very strategic focus to our resume, which is the goal of a resume is to get an interview. Um, and so this is certainly true if you're applying to a job. Your goal is to get to the next step of the process, is which is generally a, you know, it could be a phone screen or a first round interview. Um, and um, in a networking situation, the, uh, you know, the purpose of the resume would be to get that conversation or to, you know, share, share information about yourself on paper, um, in addition to sharing information on yourself in person. But the, the, the reason I like to ask this question is I think it's valuable to um, think about what you're doing. You're not trying to capture your entire work history. You're not trying to, um, um, 
it's not an exercise in futility because nobody reads resumes anymore. People do still read resumes. Um, and, uh, you know, but the main focus is a strategic one is what can I do? How can I write this resume so that I have the highest possible chance of getting an interview, getting to the next round of consideration? And then comes this classic question, how long does a potential employer initially spend looking at your resume? So again, you can just think to yourself what you think that answer might be. And the traditional wisdom is less than 30 seconds. Now, I took a little time to research this because this is one of these things, one of these career things um, that gets repeated over and over again over the years. And, and uh, I, was, I was reading a commonly recently that talked about, you know, some of these come out of nowhere or from a very old study. Um, but I did a little research and it was kind of interesting in um, a website organization called The Ladders, um, which is a career related uh, website, did an, um, an eye tracking analysis of recruiters looking at resumes. And this was just a couple of years ago. And what they found actually was that recruiters, now that could be slightly different from other types of hiring managers, but that recruiters spend six to seven minutes, um, six to seven seconds initially on a resume. And they, they because they did the eye tracking, what they saw, what, where their eyes went was the first thing they looked at was most recent job followed by second most recent job. Quick glance over to the right to look at the dates and see how long you were at those jobs. And then a quick glance down to the bottom or the second page to see where you went to school and then moved on. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, and part of what we wanna look at today is how can you, a resume really needs to um, hold up to two views, that, that initial quick view um, and then the deeper view. So generally what happens is people will mark the resumes in some way or set them aside in some way if they're looking at them physically to, to give that deeper look. And your resume has to hold up to both that, that quick initial judgment and then the deeper look um, at some of the details. So, oops. Oh. So some best practices on getting your resume to that closer look stage. This is some of the basics that you've you know, probably heard before. Um, but you know, one, one major message um, is to customize your, customize your resume to the job description. And we'll talk about some of the practical ways to make that easier to do, because that can feel daunting. Um, and generally, you are trying to make it as easy as possible for that person giving that quick glance, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to see that you're a good match for the job. And that's where the, um, where the customizing comes in. Um, as I said, we're going to talk, you know, in more detail about focusing more on achievements and results than on what your tasks and responsibilities were. Um, the, um, Advice on how quickly to uh, apply to a job varies. I've seen people say 24 to 48 hours after it's posted. Um, we encourage, you know, that first week that a job is up, um, but you, it's important to take the time to customize it. So if applying within 24 to 48 hours means you're just gonna send a generic resume that you haven't tweaked at all, then I would say it's worth taking an extra day or two to have the time to, to customize it, you know, if you're not gonna be able to get to it before then. So, um, and then another best practice is uh, either before you submit, if the timing works out, or once you've submitted, um, reaching out to potential contacts, people you already know who used to work there or have a contact there, um, to try and get your resume in front of the person doing the hiring. That extra little plug um, can also help because uh, no matter what you do, best practices wise to um, get, uh, you know, get out of that big pile, having that little push from somebody to say, hey, take a closer look at this person's resume um, can be really helpful. Okay, so one way to help make this customizing part more manageable, which we've, uh, you, we teach this to students and I've taught it to a lot of different uh, alumni over the years, is to have two different, is, is to set up a system where you have an everything resume and then an application uh, and then application resumes, right? So the idea of the everything, it's sometimes called a master resume, um, is that this is going to be a single document could be super long, could be 15 bullets for each position. It doesn't matter because it's for your eyes only. Nobody else is ever going to see it except possibly me or another advisor if you want to share it. Um, and the idea is that 
all of your work, volunteer, project experiences, skills, classes, et cetera, are all going to be together in this one document where you can easily find it and cut and paste. Um, and it's a living document. I've, I, in recent years, I've, I've encouraged people to use this Everything Resume to write rough drafts of bullets. You might not be actively applying to things, but it definitely is helpful to, you know, once a year or every six months, or maybe when you're having a performance review or asking for a promotion, um, to go in and just in regular English, write down some of the things you've been doing. Um, and then later, if you are going to apply for something or you otherwise have to make a more official version of your resume, you can go in and change those rough draft bullets into uh, resume speak. So, um, so the idea is that everything's in one place so that you're not having to track down, you know, oh, I know I wrote a resume two years ago that included that volunteer work that that matches up well with this, where is it? Um, the idea is to gradually get all the versions of your resume, all the different listings, even if relatively old stuff um, in one place, just in case you might wanna reference it. Um, and then what you do from here is when you're applying to something or perhaps you're having a networking meeting with someone and you wanna have a copy of your resume in case they ask for it or to follow as a send, uh, send as a follow-up, these you would customize. Um, and um, so uh, the key ways to customize, it's not, I'm not a fan of rewriting your whole resume. You don't have to start from scratch each time. And what you will find is they'll kind of clump together by category. So it's not like you're, again, it's not like you're rewriting from scratch every time. Um, but the idea is to look at a couple of things. One is to look at the heading for your main experience section and add a specific heading. So let's say you're applying to both um, communications related jobs and operations related jobs, right? More of the organizational, you know, um, process type things. You would take the jobs that the jobs and experiences you have that most correlate to say communications and you would describe it. Um, and instead of just saying professional experience or work experience, you would say communications experience or communications and marketing experience. You can use, I'd say two, I've seen some versions of this where people will put in three words that sort of capture your label your most relevant work and it allows you to put up at the top and give the most real estate on your front page to the jobs, the experiences that are most relevant to what you're applying to. And then you can have a second resume, a second experience section that could be called additional experience or other experience or prior experience, something a little bit more generic um, or it depends on the individual person. Sometimes if you've made a career shift, uh, say you started out in uh, teaching as I did, you might have an education experience if it all kind of you know fits together neatly. Um, but the idea is that uh, this goes to the point I made earlier of making it as easy as possible for the person reading your resume to see that you're a good match. And so you're going to look for that title of that experience section that encompasses the, the experiences you wanna put up front, you know, front and center on that first page of your resume. Um, another key thing is to, and this is where I talk, you know, say it's it's just about little tweaks, not so much about rewriting, but as you know, if you're applying to a specific job with a detailed description, look for keywords and short phrases that they use a lot and see if you can integrate them into your, um, uh, into your bullets. Um, and similarly, um, take a look at your bullets. Like let's say, let's say on your everything resume, you have 12 bullets for a particular job. You wanna choose the four to five, four to six maybe um, that are most relevant to what they're looking for. And, and you can leave out other things. You, they may well have been an important part of the job you did, but they're not as relevant to what you're applying to. So, you know, um, our Dean likes to say, it. Resumes are a curated document. You are picking and choosing and highlighting the things that are most relevant to the person reading it. Um, so, and and then the order, um, you know, a lot of us like to lay our, I know in my, in older versions of my resume, I like to lay them out logically from maybe what I did the most to what I did the least or the most general to the most specific. But instead you wanna think about putting up top the things that 
are again most relevant to the job. So let's say in a job you only spent, you know, say 10% of your time working on budgeting, but it's clear in the job you're applying to that budgeting is very important. It's it's fine to to move budgeting up to the first or second bullet. Um, again, you're increasing the chances that somebody on that first skim are going to see the key things that they're looking for. So okay. All right. So uh, we get questions a lot about um, uh, putting something up at the top. Um, profiles or summary of qualifications. Sometimes people call it a skill summary. Uh, you don't even have to label it necessarily. Often people will put their heading, you know, with their name and contact information, um, and then just have some space at the top. It's become very. It's become a little bit more mainstream. It started a lot with tech resumes, where it's become um, uh, where where a recruiter or a hiring manager wants to see right at top, what are your hard skills in, um, in tech? You know, what languages do you know? What programs do you know? Um, and so it started to transition over to non-tech jobs. Um, it is optional. And so you don't have to do this and it doesn't always make sense on a resume, um, but there's a couple things that it can be helpful with. It can definitely it, it is an easy place to customize the resume. So without having to go through all of your entries and all of your bullets, it's a relatively easy, uh, easy place to edit um, and sort of highlight um, the particular skills, you know, hard skills or soft skills that uh, a job is looking for. So something to think about. It can be helpful if you're making some sort of shift, you know, to a new field or a new role. Um, and, or if you've got a diverse work history, let's say you've done a lot of different things at a lot of different places, it can be a helpful way to pull together um, and kind of frame frame your experience. So, and we'll talk about this a little more when we get to LinkedIn profiles. It's kind of similar to on LinkedIn, there's an about section that comes up at the top um, before your experience section. And it's kind of the same concept to sort of shape a little bit, give an overall summary. So, okay. Um, all right, so those were some of the basics. And now I wanna spend some time on highlighting achievements. Right. So I'm going to start with a quote from one of my uh, favorite outside of Beyond Barnard career resources, which is the Ask a Manager blog, um, it, authored by a woman named Allison Green, uh, mostly out of the nonprofit sector, but um, um, it's a workplace advice column, highly entertaining, highly educational, and very, very good on a lot of job search stuff. If you go through her um, topics, um, she's got a lot of great um, tips for resumes, cover letters, interviewing, a lot of the stuff we're going to be, uh, a lot of same topics we're going to be covering this summer. So this is basically her argument for moving away from describing your job and moving towards describing your accomplishments and, and being a little bit more individualized, a little bit more concrete, and that that um, can be a much more effective way to, to jump out. Okay. So how do you do this? If you, if you accept this argument uh, from her and from me um, and from Beyond Barnard in general, um, how do you do this? So looking at, you know, um, part of this is looking at uh, valued skills, you know, sort of big picture skills that again could be because you're uh, trying to transfer those skills to a new role or even if you're staying within the same industry within the same title, you know, it's, it's thinking about what are, the, what are the big picture skills, the things that our um, employers are looking for. So, um, and these aren't obviously all of them, but this is just to sort of get you thinking about what are some of the things um, that can highlight accomplishments and, and be a little bit more specific about your particular value. Right. So again, not a comprehensive list, but just to sort of get you thinking, uh, you know, and teaching doesn't mean to literally be a teacher, but training, um, mentoring, you know, all of these, are you know sort of uh, uh, just the the tip of the iceberg of some of these different roles. So when you are actually constructing a bullet, the way you can personalize this, the way you can focus in on achievement, is to look at your action, right? And we'll talk about action verbs in a moment. Quantify where you can, but quantify doesn't just mean 
you know, numbers like, you know, increased sales by X percentage or, you know, the, it's great. If you have, if your job lends itself to that kind of data, that's great. Um, but think about all of these things, you know, it, 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 a lot of this is about trying to give a sense of the scope of your job um, as well as specific, you know, where you did move the needle, you know, quantifiably. Um, so it can be frequency, it can be, you um, um, web traffic, it can be percentages, there's a variety of ways of expressing quantity. Um, and you don't need to include it in every single bullet, it's not going to be a, a something to think about and to sort of ask, is there a way to quantify or otherwise measure this um, a little bit? And then you want to think about outcome, you know, did this achieve something or what was the reason for doing this? If there, there's not always a, a clear achievement of every single bullet, but you if you can give some context, what's the reason for doing what you did? All right, so there's some ideas there. And then um, writing a strong bullet in, in our um, advice is you always wanna lead with a direct active verb, a strong verb. Um, so these are just a handful um, of, from a couple of different categories. Give you some different synonyms, some different uh, options. What we're trying to avoid is some of the weaker verbs. Um, a lot of people use assisted. If you if assistance in the title or intern is in your title, you don't need to you don't need to call out assisting per se. It's okay to skip the assisted part and just say you know promoted, um, you know promoted three events per week via a company website. Even if you weren't the only one doing it, the fact that you were an intern or an assistant is clearly communicates that you weren't the only one doing it, you know, and so it just allows you to get to that more direct action. Um, so, okay. Um, and then just a few more verbs, you know, trying to give you lots, lots of ideas. Um, these are divided by, by industry roughly. Um, doesn't mean you can't use them in, in, in other industries, but the idea is to try and get you, you know, think about um, some, um, you know, using variety. You don't want to keep using the same um, word over and over again in your bullets. Again, thinking about that person skimming and, and just maybe reading the first couple of words in a bullet. Okay. Um, I'll, when, when I uh, pop out of screen sharing at the end, I've got a couple of links um, to, uh, we have a resource on Handshake with, um, I think it's action verbs for resumes. And I, I also Googled that phrase and there were a, a couple of interesting articles that popped up on various career websites um, that had a bunch of uh, different things. So if you're having trouble, you know, varying your language, there's lots of resources for that. But then let's get to the, the, the thing I think sometimes people struggle with more than, than you know, vocabulary and, and, you know, varying their terms is how do you actually capture achievements? You know, it's, it's easy often to just list your job responsibilities, a little bit harder to capture what actually made you good at the job, right? So take a look at a couple of these questions. And these are sort of prompting questions to get you to think about, um, ultimately you're trying to think about the difference between doing your job well and doing your job exceptionally well, or doing a basic job, you know, versus doing a, um, a more effective job. How can you, um, how can you capture some of that? The next to last bullet, um, I, the last two bullets are interesting. Sometimes it's hard for people, even in their own internal dialogue, and, and often when we ask, you know, in an advising session, um, sometimes people struggle with this, you know, sort of thinking about analyzing their own performance and, and saying out loud what makes you good at something. Um, definitely want to encourage you out of, of your, if you are uncomfortable with that, to, to encourage you to, to get more comfortable with that. It's important to think about in specific ways, you know, what makes you good at what you do. Um, but then we include the last bullet because sometimes it is easier to think of that in the context of, of what would a colleague, you know, a colleague that values you, a manager um, that's, um, you know, worked with you for a while, what would they say about you? What would they say were, were your strengths? And, and think about if you can capture that. So now I want to give you a little bit of practice, right? Um, and I'm going to give you a, a, some script 
script, some sample achievement bullets. Um, so you could take one of these and just fill in the blank because um, it might apply to something you've done either in um, a work situation or a volunteer situation, or maybe you want to adapt it a little. Um, some of these might not you know, be super applicable to what you do. But I'd love each of you to take pick one of these um, to either fill in the blanks or otherwise adapt. And I'm going to stop sharing for, well, actually, like, yeah, let me keep it up <laughs> while you pick one. Um, and then I'll duck out for a minute. And, and if you, um, I, if anybody's willing to share it in the chat, I would love to, to see some samples. So take a minute, pick one of these, fill in the blanks, or you know maybe vary it to apply more to what you do. You could jot it down for yourself, or better yet, if you are willing to share it in the chat, that would be great. So I'm going to stop sharing in just a second so I can see some of your answers. I'll just ask Claire to unmute for a moment and let me know if anything is popping up in the chat. We've got um, one, one piece of feedback in the chat. Cool, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment so that I can take a look at that and we can share that and hopefully a couple other people will be brave as well and share theirs. Sought out by colleagues to be recruited to their team. Good. So I like that. So you moved from, from one team to another. Um, and that again, uh, you're speaking, you know, speaking to value. It wouldn't be the only bullet you put. It would, you know, you'd obviously have other bullets that that focused on some of the specifics of what you did. But I really, I like that. Garnered praise from special education manager for advocacy for students during IEP reviews. Nice. I like that. Kept the seafloor mapping project running smoothly while project manager was on long-term leave, which included academic, private, state, federal partnerships and resulted in the first series of maps. Nice. I like that. I, that would be, uh, I would put that full bullet in your everything resume and then think about me. It's pretty long. You might want to um, divide it up. Um, but I really like, I think that's a great example of where sometimes you're asked to step in, um, you know, on a project because somebody's missing or somebody leaves the company and that's a great thing to capture. Sought out by colleagues to move contracts through complicated procurement process. Awesome. Built reputation for being knowledgeable about regulations and accessible. Nice. Yeah. This is great. You guys are definitely, uh, these are good examples. Um, and, uh, Feel free to keep working on those. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing, um, but we can um, uh, look at more of those if they come in. So, cool. All right. So now let's do. Let's go over some. Back to the sort of big picture. Let's do some of the do's and don'ts and FAQs. Some of these will, some of these are repeating some of the points I've made earlier, and some of them are new. Okay. So, as I mentioned, I didn't go. You know, we didn't break down the basics of format as we would do with, say, you know, entering students or people who are brand new to to writing a resume. But some of the formatting things that you've learned in the past are are important here. Um, this is where making sure that you're paying attention to font and being consistent about bolding and italicizing, and, and you're just having a um, a system for that. The idea again is when somebody's skimming quickly, having not only does it make your resume sort of just look better in that initial visual impression, but anything that sort of stops the reader, stops the skimming, um, is going to interrupt that flow and, and, and pot potentially make them sort of set aside your resume. So you're looking for um, being clear, being consistent, and, and all of that. 
right? Um, the one or two page document that's highlighted in yellow. Um, we get a lot of questions that used to be very, we used to be stricter about this. Um, there used to be stricter rules that everyone should stick to a, a one page resume unless you were, you know, and the, people would even give estimates like maybe after five to seven years of experience, you could shift to two pages. Uh, definitely in the digital age, there's less concern with sticking to one page. I mean, there are exceptions to this and you should always, you know, sometimes within certain industries, like I would, I would argue that a lot of tech resumes do try very hard to be um, only one page long, you know, um, but you know, tech is a big category. So it, it's a helpful thing to talk to your network about, um, you know, if there are norms within it. But generally speaking, one or two pages is fine. Um, and, um, but this does get into the curating idea that, you know, as, as you move along in your career, um, and even early in your career, if you, for instance, had a lot of different internships, or you're in an industry where you, it is normal to move fairly quickly from job to job, um, or maybe you were uh, doing contracts to work. Um, if you, it can sometimes take more than two pages to encompass everything. And that's where you have to make line things and leave some things out. So, all right, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment as well, because it comes up under the dotes. Um, I think we already talked a fair amount about making an achievement or outcome. Um, we talked strong active verbs and quantifying where possible. So basically reviewing some of those key things. So some don'ts. My friends from the 70s and 80s, we were all taught to put an object, and even into the 90s, we were taught to put an objective at the top of the um, resume, and that is completely passe at this point, especially if you label it that way. Um, and we were also all taught to type across the bottom. Notice I say type uh, for, for us oldsters. Uh, references available on request. Those are two things that just scream dated. Um, so you want to edit those out if you still have those lingering around any versions of your resumes. Um, the, the objective is gone for two reasons. You know, part of this is, is the shift that took place in the 2000s between the 2008-2010 uh, recession and the digitalization of um, the process. Um, it became I guess what we call an employer's market. So the the idea isn't, you know, whereas in the 80s and 90s, it, the whole idea behind the objective was like, this is what this job will do for me. And we've really had sort of a sea change to the whole sort of thrust of your resume and your cover letter is, here's what I can do for you. Not what the job's gonna do for me, but what I'm going to bring to the job or to your organization. And so that's part of why objectives have gone away. And as I say, they've been replaced in some cases by the skill summary um, or a professional summary, um, but it's also fine to just go to your first section, which if you're a recent grad would be education. And if you've been out for a while would be your experience section, so. Um, you want to try and avoid the sweeping, um, you know, sweeping statements for the more specific things we talked about on the on the previous slides um, uh, before, you know, where can you, can you quantify it? Can you use sort of direct examples rather than um, using these more subjective adjectives? Um, we get a lot of questions about, uh, and there's a lot of templates out there for less conventional formats or more graphically designed. Um, those are the exception is in general, you're still better off applying to most jobs um, with um, a simple Word document or a PDF, um, you know, that's not graphic graphically designed. There are some relatively simple templates out there that just add a little bit of color, a little bit of, um, you know, visual interest, and that's fine. Um, but then there's others that go further where it's, um, you know, a word map or a complete sort of redesign of how the um, information is presented. And you just want to be judicious in using those. Um, I personally, I'm, I'm actually in the middle of, we're in the middle of hiring for a couple of positions and it doesn't bug me to come across one that's different. Um, it does take a second. I have to sort of take, the, the, as I'm 
going through that big pile, it takes a minute to sort of readjust and be like, oh, okay, things are in different places. Where is the education section? Where is the skill section? Um, it doesn't tend to annoy me, but there are many other recruiters and hiring managers out there that it does really annoy. So, um, so that's the, the argument for not doing that, but there are exceptions. Um, and so if you are applying to something in a creative or visual field, um, you probably do want to, you know, sort of, it becomes a, a, a sample of your design capabilities. Um, and then it's also true that at innovative companies or organizations, um, you know, that describe themselves as cutting edge or out of the box, or we do differently, do things differently, or we're disruptors, they might respond really positively to a disruptor resume, a different looking resume that sort of approaches information in a different way. So, um, and the, um, the next bullet just refers to, again, curate, edit, you're not trying to fit everything you've ever done in, you're, you're picking and choosing so that, you know, things look um, not teeny tiny and squished together, right? And um, using the same resume for every position, we already talked about that. And then using the generic category titles like experience or work experience, volunteer experience, try and move away from those and instead categorize them, as I said, sort of according to the skill set, the experience set that you want to demonstrate, um, and then take some of the other jobs that don't fit that category and put them, that can have a more generic term like additional or prior, something like that. Some FAQs. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, it's interesting. We, we, when we work with alumni a couple of years out, they're very loath to move their education down. They want to keep leading with Barnard and Columbia or um, their graduate school. And it's just the general rule of thumb is if if is if your degree, whether it's a an undergraduate degree or graduate degree is the most relevant thing to what you're applying to, then you can continue to lead with it. Um, but generally speaking, once once you're out of school a while, whether that's undergrad or graduate, um, your experience, your, your initial, your current and most recent experience is going to be the thing that's most relevant to the person looking at your resume. Um, but again, if you're a, a brand new college grad, um, even if you have specific internship experience, still one of the sort of most relevant things about you is that you just finished, you know, just earned a degree from, um, from Barnard. And so you would, you could lead with that. And certainly if you go back to graduate school to learn a new skill set or to get further, you know, further refine your um, training in education, then you can lead with that as well. Title of organization doesn't really matter. Um, you just need to be consistent. You can't change it around. So if you, you know, work for big name companies or organizations, you can't lead with the organization in some cases and the title in others. So look at your most recent jobs. Is the title more impressive than where you're, you know, where you're working or is it the reverse? And you can go from there. And then uh, this comes up a lot. Um, uh, do you hide your age or own it? It's definitely shifted. You know, I've been doing this work for over 10 years now. And back 10 years ago, it was still, we were still basically advising people, if you try and hide your age, they're going to know you're hiding your age and they're going to assume that you are older um, than you are maybe. So don't do it. But it's become so common now to leave the dates off of your education and cut off some of the early work um, that, um, it's become so common that it actually is hard to tell whether that, and I've seen people as, you know, still in their twenties do that. Um, I don't think it's necessary, but, you know, ageism is out there more strongly in some areas than others. So, um, so that's the reason sometimes people do it. I've always been a big advocate for owning your age and your experience. Um, so I sort of lean towards that side, but um, there are plenty of, um, you know, it, again, it's become quite common to, um, to try and shave off, you know, five to 10 years, um, um, depending on how, how old you are and how experienced you are. So, okay. Going back over the one page or two. I am going to say though, if you can't fit your relevant experience into two pages. The, the exception of this is in, in academic settings where the, you are asked for a curriculum vitae, which is a much longer, can be a much longer document. But if you're asked for a resume, 
try really hard not to go beyond two pages. I, I was uh, one of the jobs we're searching for is for a career that we're hiring for is a career advisor. And I have to say, I was a little, for people who are applying to be career advisors, there were an awful lot of three and four page resumes, which was, I was not happy about. It's, it, it just makes you have to look too hard through it to see the relevant parts. I, I want to curate it. I want you to take one, one page, maybe two to show me, you know, the most relevant experience that, that aligns with what, you know, I'm looking for. So, um, at the top, you know, a lot of people, uh, I've, I've noticed recently, a lot of people will put their city and state, but not their street address. I think a lot of that arose out of privacy concerns. Um, and th But there is this weird thing called address prejudice, which can be anything from, I don't know, making a conscious or unconscious judgment about uh, the affluence or lack of affluence or whatever else is associated with a particular uh, part of town or a particular suburb, et cetera. Um, I think probably even more directly people could, you know, make an assessment of what your commute's going to be like. Um, less relevant in, you know, in our current atmosphere where there's a lot of remote work going on, but as people start to come back to work, these things can come into play. So again, you're, you're going to have to give your um, address probably in the online application, but you don't need to shout it out across the, the resume right at the beginning. So, um, the last point is a, just a general rule of thumb. Um, there's exceptions to this, but generally you want to, if you're emailing it to somebody, um, it is good to save it as a PDF so that when they open it up, um, your formatting is preserved. Um, you can do either a Word document or a PDF uh, in an online system. They will often tell you which they prefer, um, but where you are uploading your resume and cover letter, that's called, it, those are called generally applicant tracking systems or ATS. And sometimes they're more able to read Word documents than they are PDFs, but it's not a hard and fast rule. So do what you're most comfortable with or what you're directed to do within a specific online thing. Um, so I'm just checking on the time here. Oh, good, we've got some time. So just a couple of final thoughts. Um, you know, as I said, I've been doing this for a long time. And people really struggle over writing a good, most people struggle uh, to some degree in having to uh, update their resume, change the way they think about the resume. Um, and it's gonna take some work and it is a really important part as we laid out last week in sort of getting ready for a job search. Um, you, you need to have an updated, effective resume, you know, that's, that's good to go or close to being good to go. Um, but if you follow the system of the everything resume versus the application resume, and if you are steadily applying to things, it should get easier. You know, the first couple of times can be time consuming, um, but you sh it should get smoother. The tweaking should take less time. And, and as I said earlier, your resumes are going to kind of clump together in groups. So instead of having to go back to the drawing board each time, um, if you apply to a job at Amnesty International, um, and then two weeks later you apply to a similar job um, at Human Rights Watch, You're, you don't have to start from scratch. You can pull up the Amnesty International one, maybe tweak it a little bit because maybe the Human Rights Watch role is addressing a few very particular things and you wanna put those in. Um, but otherwise it should get smoother and easier. If it's not, if you're really struggling with customizing your resumes um, and it's taking a lot of time um, and, and effort and sort of slowing you down, then uh, definitely check in with myself or one of our other advisors and we'd be happy to sort of help you, you know, sort of manage that a little bit better if you're struggling. So before I stop screen sharing, just reminding you that we have more sessions coming up. You're welcome to attend any and all of them. You don't have to come every week. There's no quizzes. There's no, um, uh, you know, they, they each are standalone, even though they're, they're linked and, and related to each other. Um, so, um, We'll dive into the world of cover letters next week. Um, and then some of my colleagues are going to jump in on the next few topics, the LinkedIn profile, the networking, and the interviewing. And then I'll be back to wrap up the series with negotiating your job offer and then some thoughts about managing your ongoing professional development once you have a job. Um, and you, as I said last week, you are welcome to make an advising appointment uh, now or anytime during the series or even long after the series when you're ready um, to, um, if you're, if you need. Shake if you've had an appointment uh, prior, if you're a relatively recent graduate, you can just go straight to
Oh, I think I might have, it says my internet is unstable. Hopefully you can still hear me and see me. Um, so if you're, if you're familiar with Handshake and other words, you can go straight on there and make an appointment um, with myself or one of the other members of the team. Um, but if, you if you're not sure if you have a hand or never been on, um, you could email um, uh, our staff at beyond um, barnard at barnard.edu and they can check and see if you have an active account and help Okay, um, just don't email me directly for an appointment that just takes longer. Um, so either go through Handshake or go through the general one and um, we'll get you set up. Okay, um, oops. Okay, great. So um, we will, let me stop sharing and take some questions. Oh, good. I'm glad people can still see. Um, all right. So first question, how are the slides and recording being distributed? So um, basically, uh, alumni relations uh, has the registration list. So um, we'll re, uh, we need to, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's an easy enough answer. We're going to upload it to, uh, we share the recording and they upload it to their YouTube and we eventually uh, upload it to our YouTube channel. So post. Um, and then also, uh, you know, right after the session, um, I will share a PDF of the slides with them. So you should be getting that um, by the end of each week. Um, but if you don't get it by the end of each week, you'll get it um, Monday or Tuesday of the following week. So um, now that we're, uh, we, we sort of smoothed out the system um, after last week. So hopefully, um, uh, hopefully that will work. Um, so we got a direct question. Uh, uploading to an application system. If you upload your resume, do you also have to fill out the system prompts? Yeah. Um, um, like I said, we're in the middle of doing a couple of hires and um, I, it depends on, you know, I, I, I think most systems require you to, to both upload and break it down, but you can do, uh, you don't have to vary them. Um, so I know a lot of people are doing through the Barnard system is, is there um, from either their cover letter or the resume and, and, and just cutting and pasting it into the, the, the individual prompts within the system. And, and that's fine. You don't have to come up with new ways of describing the same thing. Um, good question. I graduated in 2017. So have almost four years of experience under my belt. Should I remove internships at this point? Um, so I'd say a qualified yes. Um, you certainly can. They, I, I wouldn't, I especially wouldn't include necessarily all of your internships. Um, but the one caveat to that would be if you did an internship that was particularly well suited to the work you're applying to, um, maybe it was a very similar role or at a very similar organization, you might want to find a way to include it. Um, and again, that's where having that that primary section of, ed, of experience that you've labeled, you know, communications experience or, um, you know, um, um, training, training and uh, training experience or legal and research experience, that umbrella will allow you to bring in possibly your current work, but then maybe an old internship and sort of group it together as being very, very relevant, even if it leaves a gap. Um, you, you need to do reverse chronology within the section, but it's okay to have gaps. And then the, um, you know, jobs you maybe had in between, but weren't as relevant, you could put in a different section. So, so I'd say in general, four years out, you're probably going to start dropping some, if not all of the internships, but it's not an absolute. It kind of depends on, on the relevance. Um, I'm applying to an internal job. Should I take any different steps when reviewing my resume? Um, that's a good question. I would say the key, I, you, you wouldn't in and of itself do, thing, do anything differently from the general advice I've given, but you've got, what you've got when you're doing it internal is some internal, you know, sort of some inside information. And so you might want to um, uh, see what you can find out in, especially informally about, um, especially if it's a different team, you know, sort of a different manager, you know, you might want to see if anybody can give you some insight on what, you know, what's particularly important to them about who they hire or what, you know, if they have any um, pet peeves about resumes, you may or may not have the resources to do that. And you might 
it's always tricky when you're applying internally. I know you're not necessarily telling everyone. So, um, but yeah, I would, I would basically do the, the same thing, but see if you can't find out a little bit of information um, about, um, you know, what's important in the job or what, what they're looking for. So are there exceptions to the one to two page rule? Uh, for instance, if applying for executive director or COO position when they're looking for a lot of leadership experience. Yeah, I, it's true. If you're very high up, um, you're going to have more leeway, right? So if we're talking about, you know, I don't know what's commonly, yeah, like the, the two you mentioned, like executive director, or chief uh, operations officer, or, you know, any of those things. Yeah, I think that um, that's where you will, you might, yeah, you, you will see a resume um, that's going, you know, over two pages. I would still make the argument that you want to curate it. You want to think about how you're arranging that information so that, for instance, the leadership and the management experience is, is you know, closer to the beginning. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a good point that for very high up positions, uh, a lot of the rules, it, the, the length rule can, um, you know, be adapted. Okay, any other questions? If you don't feel like typing, you feel free to unmute if you would like to just ask directly. All right, well, um, thank you all for, um, for joining and for your good questions and for your good examples that you shared with each other. And um, I look forward to seeing some of you one-on-one -on -one and, uh, and continuing to see you week to week in these sessions. So have a great week and uh, we'll see you again next week.